This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. Hello, college basketball fans, and welcome to the Primetime Podcast. My name is Ricky Widmer, and as always, I'm joined by the one, the only, Brandon Swanee Swanson. Hey, hey, hey. And you may be saying to yourself, but Ricky, Brandon sounds a little bit different. Is that a frog in his throat? Is he under the weather? No, none of that. Brandon is at home right now, went home for the holidays. So we have to do a little onside kick style podcast. And I say that because right now the onside kick is the only one. This is Brandon's first call-in podcast. So he'll be over the phone on the MVP hotline. And we got a jam-packed show where we're going to be talking some Wisconsin Badgers and Joe Ryan. We're going to be talking some Michigan State Spartans basketball and then some just general teams in college basketball to maybe be excited for come tournament time and conference tournament season. But, Brandon, we start the show with Bo Ryan, who we thought he was going to retire after the loss to Duke in the national title game, decides not to. Now, a few weeks ago, Bo Ryan, all of a sudden, you know what? I'm done. I can't do it no more. Goodbye. That's basically what we got. You know, Ricky, the first thing I'm going to ask you for the MVP hotline is it's sponsored by, you know, fresh, uh, you know, fresh sandwiches from Subway, the Subway Fresh Take hotline, or is it just, just the MVP hotline? We got to work on that. We got to get a sponsor for that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. You know, we're going to put you on that, Brandon. You're going to find it. You got to find us a sponsor for the MVP hotline. Okay, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. But uh, going, going going back to what we're talking about here, Bo Ryan, you know, he retires. He he ends his career a little earlier, a little prematurely from what we thought it was going to be because he did come out and say at the beginning of the season that this one would be his last. You know, as Ricky, you and I talked about it um, in, in the pre-production that, you know, maybe he didn't want to have a, a farewell tour. Maybe he didn't mm-hmm. want to do that. Or maybe he looked and he didn't see – Sam Decker, Josh Gasser, Trayvon Jackson, Frank Kaminsky on the court, and he said, mm, yeah, this isn't going to go so well. Then he retired. I mean, we I don't think we're quite sure as to why he retired. I think it was getting to be that time. I mean, he, he really went out on a high note. I mean, Wisconsin isn't towards the top of the Big Ten this year. They're towards the bottom at, I believe, seven and five. But he has had one heck of a career. And I think, really, at the end of the day, he is going out on top. Well, and I mean, I think of any other coach, and I know, like you mentioned, he could have went, the only other note he could have went out higher on was beating Duke. That would be the yeah. highest of notes he could come out on, but most coaches, you see that and go, okay, well, Sam's going to leave, Frank's going to leave, I'm just going to leave with him, and Originally, he doesn't. Did part of me feel like he thought, you know what, I'll give it one more year, I'll do the farewell like Jeter, and then after a sluggish start, go, hey, you know what, this isn't going to go well and I'm going to get out of here? I don't know. I'm not Bo Ryan, but the thing I think of, and this is my little just concoction of why I think he walked away is, it was as simple. Uh, it was as simple as, if you're not feeling it, you're not feeling it. And why go through the motions? Why be that That's coach like, that comes in? It's like, you know what? I don't want to be here, but you know what? I got to do this today. Why do well, that? That's what, comes, that? that's what it comes down to. You know, I don't, any coach that feels like they're going through the motions clearly believes that they no longer not have it necessarily but they no longer have that drive, mm-hmm. that, that want. They don't have the hunger, you know, to, to go out there and, and feast each and every game. And I know that sounds more like a player mentality than a coach, but that's, that's the fact of, I think, why possibly he, re- he retired now is because maybe he just wasn't there anymore. And, you know, with everybody, there becomes – especially later on in life, there's family obligations. You want to just be with your family more. You want to have more time for them. I mean, it could, be, it could have been, and it could be a number of things. But I think at the end of the day, no one's going to fault him for going out prematurely. 
I don't think a single person will fault him for doing that because of the fact that he has been so committed for so long, so many years. This guy loves the game of basketball, loves these kids that he was able to coach for so long, has moved them along, has made them not only great players, but great characters who will go on, in, in many, go on in the NBA. He's going out a true champion. And I don't think it would have mattered if he went out at the end of the season or right now. Everyone's going to still continue to have the utmost respect for a man like Bo Ryan. Well, and I mean, we're all going to have the respect for Bo Ryan. If you look at the career that he kind of set up over his coaching career as a total, 364 wins to only 130 losses. That's a 73.7 win percentage. He's been at Wisconsin since 2001, and he's had, this is over the entire thing, he's had four NCAA Division III national titles, three Big Ten championships in 04, 08, and the last one in 2015, four Big Ten regular season championships in 02, 03, 08, and 2015, and then two NCAA regional championship final fours in 14 and 15. And he ended with arguably his best teams of his career, as you can see by the two final fours that he had. But the thing that I also think of is unless you were going to do it at the end of last season, because let's be honest, walking away from the game from any game is hard. Just look at Brett Favre, how hard it was for him. Sure. to walk away and how hard it may still be. He may come back at any moment. We don't know. But maybe there was something where it's like, you know what, I'm going to walk away. And then Barry Alvarez goes, hey, you know what, don't think of this like too rash. Go home, talk talk to the wife, talk to the family. What are you going to do about this? And then he decided, okay, I'm going to come back. But then you got to think of it. He was sitting there at this point. Eh, it's like, okay. We're like seven and five. Are we going to be that big of a team? And it was right now where with one non-conference game left, a decision had to be made because it was either I do it now or I do it at the end of the season. There's no way that once Big Ten play started, there was no way that Bo Ryan could walk away during Big Ten play because then you're kind of crippling your team you know what I'm saying and we talk in like football and stuff like that when we talk about college football like how oh the season is long and it's grueling and a coach like that's a lot to go through usually we talk about that on the NFL side when players are going to walk away much like Peyton Manning right now but the basketball season's even longer looking at Wisconsin's schedule their first game is November 13th And their last regular season game is March 2nd. If you make the tournament, you're going all the way until April, the beginning of April. So that's a November to early April journey if you get that far. And maybe he was just like, hey, you know what? I don't want to mess over this team in Big Ten play. Let's say we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, and 5. That sixth game against Michigan State, I don't want to leave seven games into conference play, I'm just going to leave right now. Well, Ricky, too, you have to think that the season's not just November to April. The season doesn't end after that because you've got a whole off season. There's so much more that goes into it. How much work did he have to do going into this season, too? Exactly. I mean, that's what it all goes into. And and a coach, we've been told this by the amount of broadcasts that we've done of different sporting events, mm-hmm. and we'll talk basketball right now because we've done all of them, um, even that campsite, uh, campfire volleyball. But right now <laughs> we'll talk about basketball. How many times have we been told by coaches, you know, the game's over, players, it, it sticks with them for a little bit, but once, you know, you're on the bus and stuff like that, it's, man, you know, let's get some food, let's joke around, let's do this kind of stuff. For a coach... It never ends. Mm -hmm. There's always the continuous thinking on a big loss. What? Oh, gosh, what can I do better? You're already game planning. You're already game planning 
not just for the next game, but for the next time you play that team, which may not be until weeks or months down the road. It is such a task on a coach. I mean, it's incredible what these guys go through, and and women as well for the women coaches. Mm -hmm. But it's just incredible the amount of time and effort and stress that goes into doing that each and every year. So sometimes at the end of the day, you just go, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah, and I mean, as the thing I think of is look over at the football side of it when Urban Meyer was with Florida. Now, I know that was a little bit of health reasons too, but that was one of those ones where it's like, hey, you know what? I got to worry about myself. Then he gets everything together, comes back. Now he's the coach of the Ohio State Buckeyes. And the thing with Bo Ryan, and I think this will get us into – the next thing we're going to talk about, the one thing I can't fault Bo Ryan for is doing what's in his heart because I'd rather have him as me, myself, my opinion, i rather have him walk away right now and say I'm done. I just can't do it anymore rather than say, okay, well, I'm going to drag this out. I mean, should he have probably retired in the offseason? You could make that point. You could make the point of unless he was 100% sure that he could go the entire season, he shouldn't have came back. And if you're one of those people, I will let you have that opinion because that's what makes this world the great place is that we all have our own opinion. But... The thing you got to also think of, he may have, let's say, November 12th, he may have been sitting in his office going, I can do this. I want to come back. I'm 100% sure. Then by November 20th, four games in, okay, two and two. Now I'm like 75% sure. And just as the season has gone on so far, just kind of been like, hey, you know what? It is time to walk away. So the one thing you also got to think about is you can feel one thing early on, but after what, we're like 13 games, I want to say, into the season, your opinion can change once it starts. Yeah, it can. I mean, it has for you plenty of times when we're doing college pickums, isn't that well, right? Yeah. How yeah, many How fun. many times did I uh, want to pick BYU and I shouldn't have because they lost in their bowl game to Utah, but I digress. Let's move on to the other <laughs> Big Ten team we're going to talk about, and it's what the podcast is titled about. The Michigan State Spartans have started the season undefeated. Brandon, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Can they go undefeated? Is this team good enough to do the impossible? Can they go undefeated? Uh, You know, Ricky, it's always a tough task. Let's just say regular season, though. Let's just say What's regular that? season undis- yeah, no, undefeated. That's, 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 okay. That's, that's what I was thinking. That's okay. What I, that's what I thought you were asking me. Yeah. And, and it's always, and I'm going to go back to, to, to my point of it, 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 for any team, right now Michigan State, they're number one. I mean, they've got Denzel Valentine working really well for them, but could miss two to three weeks. That's huge. He's been one of their biggest, biggest players, averaging 18.5 points per game seven assists per game. This guy's huge for them. I mean, if they don't have him, what's going to happen? So that is a huge factor for this team right now, and that is the reason why I'm saying that Michigan State will not go undefeated here in this regular season. They've got what looks like a fairly, fairly easy schedule, at least for a little bit. They'll play Maryland again. They'll play the Lens. On uh, January 23rd, that's a big game that I'll be looking out for. But the rest of the games, really, I would say, if you put the team side by side, go in favor of Michigan State. I really do. See, and that's the thing that I thought of was when this first started and they were like 5-0, 6-0, I'm sitting there going, okay, maybe people are going to call me stupid when they look at my Final Four be like before the season prediction because I didn't have Michigan State anywhere near it. And to me, the 
my favorite in the in the Big Ten was Maryland. This yeah. Maryland team that you've got Mellow Trimble coming back and and they've got Solomon coming over from Duke and this Spartan team. I'm like, yeah, they've got Costello came back, but besides besides Denzel Valentine, what else do they have back? Travis Trice left. Brendan Dawson is no longer there. I mean, Forbes, who was their fourth leading scorer, is now their second leading scorer, of course, because Dawson and Valentine are not there anymore. But there's a part of me that when you say, can this team go undefeated? I kind of want to say no. And the reason why is the conference that they play in. Let's be honest. When it comes to basket, when it comes to football, let's say, what's the toughest conference in all of football, Brandon? Oh, that is totally the SEC. What about basketball? What's the toughest? Like, and this one's a little bit more opinionated, but most people would say which conference is the toughest conference in basketball, college basketball. For me, I'd say the Big Ten. Yeah, it's the Big Ten. I mean, you have the teams that have just kind of fought their way to, I mean, Wisconsin's been good. Michigan State's been good. You have Ohio State was good. Two year, I mean, the last two years for Ohio State haven't been the Aaron Kraft years, but Maryland's come in and give this team a boost. Indiana, Tom Crean usually has his boys ready to play, and there's going to be a time where this Michigan State team just doesn't have it. And, I mean, I'm looking at their non-conference schedule. Iowa may be a little bit of a weaker team than they were last year. Michigan State should get the win. Early on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're going to start 7-0 and in the Big Ten, only because Wisconsin ain't what they used to be. However, I'm looking at the Iowa games, maybe Illinois. Illinois hasn't been that great this season. But that Maryland game, that's going to be the first one. Then they got to play Purdue. How are they going to do against Michigan, Ohio State? can play tough against this team. And one of the first things I think of when we think of undefeated is that 2004-2005 fighting Illini team. Because they they were the best team that, for me, being born in 1990, this is the, that Illinois fighting Illini team was the best college basketball team that I've ever watched. Only lost one game in the regular season, and it was on 1-3. Only played one really bad game, and that was the national title against the Tar Heels. But I ask myself, can this Michigan State not just go undefeated, let's say they do lose a game, can this Michigan State team be as good as that Illinois fighting Illini team? And I say no. And the reason why I say no, Brandon, Denzel Valentine, 18.5 points per game. Brian Forbes, 12.7 points per game. They only have two guys averaging double digits a night. Go to that 0405 Illini team. Luther Head, 15.9. D. Brown, 13.3. Darren Williams, 12.5. Roger Powell Jr., He had 12 points a game. James Augustine, 10.1. They had six guys, or five guys, averaging double digits a night. That's why that team was so good. Michigan State, I don't think, has the scoring all the way around to kind of dominate like the fighting line I did, like, what, 10 years ago? Over 10 years ago? Yeah, you know, I'll agree with you on that one. I, I don't know. This Michigan State team, I take no credit away from, nothing away from them because they, they're they good. I think they showed it. You know, they're 12-0 and to start things off this season. And they're going to be good. I mean, they have one of the best coaches, arguably the best coach in college basketball in Tom Izzo. But it's what you said, and it's what I was thinking. Do they have enough scoring? 
mm-hmm. in my mind, you want to have com- to be feel comfortable at least three guys who are averaging double figures a night. When you have two, hopefully, that's that's not going to do it. Not in my mind. And then it's in, you know, it's also about the defense too. You know, we have enough guys that are going to step up and play defense. I think Michigan State does, but I think it is more on the offensive side of things. It's you know how your team is built. Is your team going to be built for for games where you're scoring a lot, or is mm-hmm. your team built for defensive games? That's you know that's another thing too. So I think that what we've seen out of this team, we've seen a lot of scoring in the seventies, a lot of scoring in the seventies. Haven't seen too many games where it gets up into the nineties, but the games that we did see that Boston College, they won 99-68. EMU, they won 89-65. And then ARPB, 92-46. to So they showed they can score some points. But they've also showed that they're probably going to be more in the 70-80 mm-hmm. type range. Can I throw something out at you? Go right ahead. I'm going to throw out some stats. There's a certain team in the Big Ten – that has about five players averaging double digits from top to bottom. We have 15 points per game, 12.5, 11.3, 10.7, and 10.5. What team in the Big Ten do you think I'm talking about that has five players averaging double digits a game? Is it Maryland? It is Maryland. Maryland, the Terrapins, you have... In the order that I just listed, Trimble, Carter, Layman, Stone, and Rashid Solomon. This is a team that, I mean, look at their schedule. If they don't lose at North Carolina on December 1st, we're not just talking about Michigan State. We're talking about the Maryland Terrapins as well. And I'm going to say this. Maryland, to me, has more of a chance to do what Illinois did 11, 10, 11 years ago than Michigan State. And the reason being is scoring. They have five players averaging double digits a night. And see, that's what's going to, that's exactly what's going to take you to the next level. Mm -hmm. When you have guys who can score. I mean, that's, Obviously, that sounds pretty, like, duh, but it's it's huge. And that's why it's so important that you get solid play all the way around, from the guys who are in the starting lineup to the guys who are on the bench as well. And the perfect example, Valentin, he's going down. Valentin goes down, and who's going to be the next man up? You have to have a next man up. If they can't do that, they lose that production there in that spot for a couple of games. Do you lose those couple of games while he's out? I mean, what happens? And then how far and how big of a hole are you in then? Mm-hmm. How far back are you then? So I think that's a big big thing to look at as well that you have to consider going forward. Well, and one of the things that I think of, just look at to last year with, and I know that every single team, has the, oh, well, if Denzel's not on the floor, this player is going to run our offense. But last year, Michigan State was kind of spoiled. They had, when Travis Trice was out there, Travis Trice ran the offense. He was a great point guard. But when he came off and had to take a breather, who was there to fill his shoes? Denzel Valentine. And this year, I just don't think Michigan State has a player that can fill Valentine's shoes like Valentine had to fill Trice's shoes. And could I be could I be dead wrong? Yes. Michigan State will probably because I'm saying what I'm saying today, I'll tell you what, Michigan State will probably go undefeated. Maryland will probably lose five games because that's how the world of sports likes. The world of sports Likes to make Ricky Widmer suffer. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because I'm a Cubs fan. But there's just something about these two teams that I feel like they can beat 
anybody in the Big Ten except for each other. And there's a part of me that says both these teams go undefeated in conference until that January 23rd. And whoever wins that game ends up winning the Big Ten regular season crown. However, if I was to put my money on it, I would put my money on Maryland having a better chance to go undefeated in the Big Ten than Michigan State because of the upset factor. I feel like Michigan State has, because of what we talked about with scoring, a team like Michigan, a team like Ohio State, a team like even Penn State, one team, one night, I feel like can get the better of them or make Valentine fall out of a game and then they get the better of them. That's what I think. Well, I'll tell you what, though, with Valentine being out and he's going to miss two to three weeks, you know, in that span, you know, they could be playing Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Penn State. I mean, any of these teams then could could definitely step up to the challenge then and really be motivated because they see that Valentine is no longer in the game. Let's take an Adam, guys. You know, let's go. This is our chance. This is our chance to knock them off, move up in the polls ourselves. Let's go. Let's take it. One of those teams might do it. Yeah, and I mean, for those of you who didn't hear Brandon a little bit ago, two to three weeks, that's what Denzel Valentine is going to miss. And that was just reported seven hours before we started to hit the record button on this podcast. So that means if, let's say, it's two weeks, he's out until the 4th. If it's three weeks, he's out until around the 11th. So when the national championship in football is going to get played. So really, I mean, the lucky thing for Michigan State is that hopefully he only misses those first three conference games. Well, first four. He'll miss the Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, and Penn State. But there's a thing of after this, and I'll throw this question at you, Brandon, after this procedure... Does it take him a little? Let's say he's out till the 11th and he misses the first four Big Ten games. Does it take him a little bit to get reacclimated to playing basketball again? You know, I don't think so. I mean, because if you're a guy like that, you've been doing it this long, I don't think it's really going to take you too long to be playing basketball again. I think it's going to be more of a case of you know, hey, um, j- just getting a good feel for being back on the court, you know, you know, taking the shots that you usually take, stuff like that. You know basketball. Yeah. You know, in, in your mind how the play goes, stuff like that, you know it. You don't – it doesn't go away well, from you. And that's what uh, I was I – mean, he, he, he cleans up – He's clean. He, he, he's, the surgery is to clean up um, a small chip of cartilage in his left knee that came loose. Mm-hmm. That is more. It sounds very preca- like a pre- precautionary procedure, you know, just to take it away and stuff like that. Clean, as it sounds, clean it up. It'll be more like cuts and stuff like that on the court because you don't want something catastrophic to happen once you get back on the floor. You want to just kind of work out that that knee again and make sure everything's okay. That's the biggest thing for me. Yeah, and that's what I kind of meant. The more of like the feel for the game a little bit, like just getting, okay, I haven't been playing with this team for a little bit. And I mean, it's only four games, so you can't say, well, and I mean, conference wise, it's only four games. So you can't say, well, the team got on a roll without him and now he's got to get back into it. But before we go on to the last thing we're going to talk about, I want to pose this question to you. Who do you think, Wins out of the out of these two teams, or you got three choices: Michigan State, Maryland, or other. Who wins the Big Ten regular season crown? Who's number one when we enter the Big Ten conference tournament? That's, you know, that's a tough one. I I am probably gonna go. Mm, that's tough. You know I love to do this to you. Do you want my answer first so you can think a little bit because I surprised you with it? 
No, because um, I know your answer. Um, <laughs> I know your answer is Maryland, yep. and I'm not sure if mine is Maryland or if it's Michigan State. It's all going to come down that, to that January 23rd game. Yeah, that's that's what it comes down to. I'm going to say Maryland. I'm going to say Maryland. I'm going to say I'm going out on a limb to say Maryland. They're a good team, but I think Michigan State is going to be right there with them the entire season. However, the reason I say Maryland is because I think that Michigan State, maybe, possibly, in that time that Valentine is out, Mm -hmm. there could be an upset, possibly two. And Maryland, I don't think there's as much of an upset factor with them. But, you know, you can never count on anything in sports. Well, and I mean, the one thing I will say is a team – that is upset worthy, and I know I kind of talked down my team earlier in this podcast, but watch out for that Illinois game for Michigan State because without Valentine playing in that game, Illinois has been able to upset some major forces in the past. Last year they were without Ravante Rice, upset um, Maryland, in the uh, State Farm Center, of course, the Michigan State game is going to be on the road, so that could kind of help the Spartans because it's a road game for the Illini. But before we end the podcast, Brandon, we got one more segment. This one is in pre-production before we hit the record button. You were telling me about all these teams that you're like, man, I want to talk about this team's doing well, this one. How about this team without this head coach? I'm going to pose this question and just let you run with it. What is one team or teams that you're looking at now to say, man, I want to watch them closely during conference play because they could be, they could be either runners by the time we get to the tournament or they could be fallers because they haven't been able to adapt to offseason changes. You know, Ricky, the first team I want to talk about is the number three team right now in the AP poll and the number two team, the number two team in the coaches' poll. That's Oklahoma. You know, Oklahoma is not a team I don't think too many people look at usually. I mean, right now, a lot of people are looking, looking at them in college football. But I don't think as many people thought that they would be talking Oklahoma in college basketball. I knew I was not one of those people. They're currently 8-0. They sit on top of the Big 12 standings. They got some huge games coming up at the start of January, January 2nd, January 4th. You play at home versus Iowa State, the number 11 team, and then you play on the road at Kansas, the number two team in the AP poll. Those games are going to be huge. January's going to be huge. Because not only after you play Kansas, you'll play K-State, Oklahoma State, West Virginia again on the 16th. And then, and I shouldn't say West Virginia again, that'll be the first time against West, West Virginia. But then again, you'll play on the road at Iowa State. They've got one hell of a January coming up for Oklahoma. But I think that's a team that if they can get through some of these tough matches, because so far, the only ranked team that they've beat and beat pretty good was Villanova, 78-55 to 55, a couple of weeks ago. I'm interested to see what this team can do because it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, I think Oklahoma, if they can get through a couple of these teams, they could make themselves a nice run and be a great surprise team. Well, to me, it comes down to in the Big 12 this year, Kansas is making the tournament. Oklahoma is making the tournament. Those are my two. As of right now, if you said, Ricky, you've got every con, like if you put every conference in front of me, like let's say the big one. So like Pac 12, Big 10, Big 12, the ACC. And you're like, just highlight the teams that you're right now are automatically going to get into the tournament at the end of the year. I would put Kansas and Oklahoma as my only two because. Yeah, maybe Baylor, Iowa State, but those are the only two that I'm like, oh, they're going to be there for sure. I don't think there's going to be 
a fallout for them. The only question I have with Oklahoma, and it comes with Kansas too, is which one's going to win this thing? And by win this thing, I mean the regular season. Because if one of them wins the regular season crown, and then maybe the tournament, because I feel like they could get upset in the tournament and still have this happen, they're going to be a one or two seed come March. The way I see it playing out is Kansas or Oklahoma is going to win the regular season crown, and whoever wins the regular season crown is going to win the is going to win the tournament crown, or the other team is going to win the tournament crown. These are going to be the two that we say get the automatic bids from the Big Twelve. My question is just who who gets it because this Kansas team. I mean, to go off of your Oklahoma kind of thing is you got to look at Kansas too. And this Kansas team hasn't been, I'm, I'm going to say hasn't been the Kansas teams that Bill Self has had in the past. Where like when they had the Jeff Whitty Kansas Jayhawks, where it was like this team's going to the championship, they're going to play Kentucky kind of a thing. Whereas last year you had the kind of like derailed Jayhawks with the Cliff Alexander thing, the, okay, how are these guys going to fit together? It seems like Perry Ellis at the lead of this thing. I know that Wayne Sheldon is at the top. It seems like the Jayhawks are kind of coming together. However, like you said, those Sooners, when you got a guy like Buddy Heald, 23.5 points per game, and then Isaiah Cousins, and Jordan Woodard behind him at 13.8 and 13.3, respectively. I think Oklahoma has, and I'm, I kind of would say Oklahoma has a chance to upset Kansas, especially in that first meeting. They have a chance to upset the Jayhawks. I think that Oklahoma has a chance to actually upset in this Big 12. To be quite honest with you, I think that we could see Oklahoma at the end of it if they keep this run going. That's what it is right now, I think, a run. Uh They keep it going. They could have themselves the Big 12 at the end of the season. And I think coming into this one, there wouldn't be too many people that said, yep, it's going to be Oklahoma this year in the Big 12. I mean... If you would have said it's Oklahoma, okay, a couple months ago, if you would have said it's Oklahoma in the Unless Big 12, you're in then, Norman. Unless that? you live in Norman and are well, yeah, a exactly, Sooner exactly. fan. I would have said, no, 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 no. You must be talking football. That's what <laughs> I, that's what, honestly, that's what I would have said to them because, I mean, would you have looked, I'll ask you, would you have looked at Oklahoma, you know, a couple of months out coming into the season? No, Kansas was my team. Kansas was exactly. the one Kansas, that I selected people, to win, maybe. and to me the big splash was Hook'em Horns and Austin. That's who I thought was going to make a bigger with, splash. With Shaka Smart, who's already put his his stamp. Um, I know, I love uh, it on it with the the win against North Carolina a couple of weeks back. I love it. But I would have said Kansas, and I would have said Iowa State. Even though though Fred Hoiberg leaves, they still rank number eleven. They still are a team that I think people are going to be watching. They're still a team that hey, you know what, they're, they're going to do really well when they're going to get into the tournament and they are just going to make people shed some, some tears because they're not going to go far. But I would not have been looking at Oklahoma, and that's what I love about college basketball. There are teams that come out of left field mm-hmm. and end up being really good. Well, and I mean, the thing with, and why I kind of phrased the question how I did when I said didn't kind of, adapt to offseason moves. I was talking about Iowa State because you mentioned them in our kind of prep time before the podcast. But, I mean, with Iowa State, they were a team that was on a run, just lost this past Saturday to Northern Iowa by only 81-79. They've been a team, Northern Iowa's been a team that, hey, we're going to make the tourney and then shock you with some threes. That's what they've done. They beat North Carolina. They beat Iowa State. They have been running some tables so far this season. All they got to do is win. In my mind, all they have to do is win their conference. And if they win the Missouri Valley, they're in. That's the way I see it. Because to me, a team out of the, of course, okay, let's say not win it. Because if you win it, you get the automatic bid. All they have to do is finish within the top two 
If they finish second in the Missouri Valley, they're in the tournament for me because they beat two tournament teams. I mean, come on. Iowa State most likely is going to be there. It's like, I'd say right now Iowa State may be a, uh, maybe a four seed at the highest, a six seed at the lowest, depending how the rest of their season goes. And North Carolina, who, let's be honest, they're going to be a one or a two. They're going to be either the one and they won the ACC or a two in the tournament this year. So if you beat a four, a two and a four, let's say, yeah, you're in the tournament for me, even if you don't win the Missouri Valley. Well, I'll tell you what, now that we start talking about North Carolina, they're currently playing right now. They're winning their game 72-56, but Marcus Page has tweaked his right ankle. He did that in the first half. It's stiffened enough during halftime. He's questionable to return. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, if if anything happens to him, you know that's that that wouldn't be good for the Tar Heels, who have been surprisingly not as dominant as they have been in years past. A lot of people were looking at them. Oh, North Carolina, they'll be number one through three for most of the season. They sit at number seven right now. Already two losses this season. Yeah, but I mean, with North Carolina, except for maybe the Tyler Hansbra years, and of course I know it's Tyler Hansbro, but. Except for those years, have we really expected them to be the Illinois fighting Illini from 0405 dominant? Probably not. And the only thing that hurts North Carolina so much now in the resume is their two losses. Like, if they would have lost to Maryland, okay, fine. You lost to the number two team in the nation at the time, but your losses are to Northern Iowa. On the road, who's a Missouri Valley Conference team, and then you lost on the road to Texas, who, yeah, they're a power, well, in football, they'd be a power five. They're one of the bigger conferences, but you lost to them on the road, and that's the important thing. These losses have been on the road. So, yes, they hurt, but being on the road helps them a little bit. I think North Carolina is going to be fine. Maybe I'm different, Brandon. I know you're the North Carolina fanboy, but I feel like the Tar Heels are going to be fine during the ACC play, but maybe I'm wrong. I think they'll be okay. I just don't know. With what I've seen so far from them this year, they don't exuberate that same, that same, you know, North Carolina's playing in this game. I feel like North Carolina's going to win. If North Carolina's playing in this game, I hope they win. They'll probably win. They're pretty good, but um, that other team could definitely show up. Like against Texas, you know, a year ago, I would have said North Carolina, they're winning. Even this year, I said North Carolina, they're winning. But Texas is better than they were, what they were last year. So, that, yeah. you know, it's hard to say that. But uh, they're, they're still good. Maybe not as dominant, my opinion. Okay, I'm going to bring up two teams, and I want to get your thoughts on them. The first one, I'm going to bring them up, talk about them a little bit then throw it over to you. This is a team that I think could make a, let's say not right now, but come end of February. Well, into February and March, we're talking about this team in blind resumes, the Utah Utes. And if any of you saw their game this Saturday against the Dukies, in New York at Madison Square Garden, a 77-75 to win in overtime over Duke. Just maybe it's because I actually watched this team, and this is a team that, like, this is the first time I've seen Utah play this year because how many games from the Utah Utes do we get playing in Illinois? Not very many, but this is a team that they had the guard play to me. They had the forward play. This is a team that was able to take, and I know for the first half, Grayson Allen had flu-like symptoms, didn't have a point in the first half, got an IV at halftime, played a lot better in the second half, but this is a team that kind of held the uh, Blue Devils in check, and I was like, holy crap. This is a team that, like, I haven't even seen. And I just, watching that game and listening to 
Dickie V's beautiful voice with the, oh, Mr. Nestler, the, you know what? After this game, we're going to, they're going to go see Matilda and my family. I'm coming here to see the Knicks and the Bulls. While listening to him, I'm just thinking to myself, okay, this Utah team, there's something about them. There's something about this team, and we could be talking about them come tournament time. However, the Pac-12, when it comes to basketball, and maybe I'm going to offend some Pac-12 fans here, but they're not the sexy teams in college basketball like they usually are in football. I'll tell you what, that was a pretty spot on. Spot on, Dickie V. So congratulations and uh, props to that. You've well, been that, working on the voice. Well, now. that's what he sounded like. He was talking about uh, how... He's like, oh, let me think what he was saying. He was like, you know what? The, I'm going to say Mr. Nestle. I don't know who he was doing it with, but I just like saying Mr. Nestle. But Mr. Nestle, you, when you get this age, you got to live it how you got the life. And me and the family going to go out, spend it in New York. And they're going to go to the Broadway and Matilda. I got to see the Knicks and the Bulls man playing four overtimes last night. I love Dickie V. I love him. <laughs> I love Dickie V. He's a good one. But do you kind of, I know that this is like the team that I brought to the table, not the Oklahoma, but can a team like Utah, can they, are we talking about this team come, come tournament time? Uh, we'll be talking about them. I think they'll be in the discussion, but I think they'll still be flying under the radar because it'll be the teams like the Arizona's, Mm-hmm. We'll probably get a cow in there. I don't know if we'll be talking Utah as much. I could be wrong. They can make a climb towards the top of the rankings or at least to the middle. Um, but I don't know if they'll be on the radars of too many people. They may be that team that makes a, a run in the in the tournament. Here's my with that. Here's my only thing. A run. I don't know if a lot of people will be looking for them to do that, though. Here's my only thing with Utah, and my only just, oh, my little bugaboo is they've got a guard in Lorenzo Bonham, and he's a transfer guard, came from junior college, now he's playing in D1 NCAA, and he's just got these these little juco habits, as Dickie V mentioned to them during the broadcast. I'm going to give you an example. There was some player for Duke, I can't remember who it was, was shooting a three, and Bonham went to block it, and he fouled him. Three was made, go to the line for four. It's stuff like that where it's like, and I could just still hear Dickie V, oh, why'd you have to do that? That was a, that's a freshman mistake, the Juco habit. Stuff like that is what the Utes have to iron out, but to me, I think this could be a a scary team in the Pac-12. I'm going to give you one more team. And it's a, to me, it's a funny team that this team isn't better in the rankings because arguably they have the number one draft pick on their team. But the LSU Tigers. Do Ben Simmons Tigers make a run come March? Uh, You know, I'm not sure. I really have not taken a look at LSU. I'll be honest with you. I've looked at a lot of the other ones. LSU is not a team that I have even really put on my own map yet. So I can't really comment on that, Ricky. That one kind of takes me a little off guard. They're six and four. Let's be Uh, honest. How many teams from the SEC do we usually watch when it comes to college basketball? You know, not too many. Um, But... uh, no, I haven't. I haven't taken a look at them at all. They had a three-game losing streak. They lost by one to Marquette, NC State. They lost eighty-three seventy-two, and then uh, they lost seventy to fifty-eight. The game after, and they lost to Houston, one hundred five ninety-eight. Um, I, I, I don't. I really can't tell you much, Ricky. Is that uh, they they got a game coming up on the fifth of January against Kentucky. And then they've got a game coming up on January 19th against Texas um, A&M. Those two teams are ranked. Those are two teams that I'll be interested to see how they play against these 
top top tier teams to see how they go against them, especially the Texas A and M, who sits at nine and two in their own conference in the SEC. Well, there was the reason why I really bring them up is they play a team that you mentioned a little bit ago, and if. I almost missed it looking at the schedule because they've got all these conference games and then one non-conference game just sneaking in there on January 30th. They play a home game against right now the number three team in the country, Oklahoma. This LSU team, and Brandon, I'm like you, haven't watched much of LSU this year because, come on, I mean, you're trying to watch so much football's on the front burner right now and when you get to college basketball for me it's the games that are on espn the ones like like i said utah and duke which was on during the day on saturday to me though just looking at lsu schedule because this is a team where you turn on sports center you always hear about ben simmons this ben simmons that and i just thought to myself what about LSU? Like, who's talking about LSU? Are we only talking about them because they have Ben Simmons on their team? If LSU beats Oklahoma on January 30th, and I know this can all change because, let's be honest, the Big 12 can knock Oklahoma down a peg or two depending on how things play out by then. The game on January 30th could put LSU on the map, of course, Texas A&M and Kentucky can do that as well. But before we wrap things up, Brandon, are there any last teams that we missed? Any teams you feel like we should watch throughout this season? Uh, let us see. Let us see here. Um, you know, I'll, I will say one thing is that Purdue currently – at number 14, they're 11 and 1 in the Big Ten, and I should have talked about them earlier. But for right now, Purdue, 11 and 1, but that one loss, who they come to? Number 17 ranked Butler, 74 68, mm-hmm. they lost. I'm interested to see. They've got Maryland on February 6th, they've got Maryland again on February 27th. I'm interested to see how this. Purdue team ends up doing for the rest of this season. They're ranked number 14 right now, but how good are they? Are, are they, they contenders good? or pretenders? Are they ranked? Exactly. That's the question. Exactly. Are they, are they coming to the bottom with a fake ID or not? Okay, Cowherd. Yeah, I <laughs> are they trying to pull the they, Iowa? <laughs> I, 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 I say it because what have they done? You know, what mm-hmm. have they done? And right now, not a whole lot. They lost to the one team that was ranked that they've played so far. How are they going to do within their conference? That'll be interesting. Well, that is going to do it for the primetime podcast this week. I want to thank you guys for checking out this podcast and listen to myself and Brandon Swanson talk a little bit of sports. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Young underscore Swan 19 is Brandon. I'm at Ricky Widmer. Most Valuable Podcast is at Most Valuable Pod. If you're on SoundCloud, go ahead, hit that like, hit that repost. Go ahead and follow us. If you're on YouTube, like and subscribe as well. Thank you guys again for checking this out. Let us know down below in the comment section what you guys think of anything we talked about today, especially that Michigan State-Maryland conversation that we had right in the middle. I hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. Me and Brandon will see you next week on the Primetime Podcast special announcement to come check the YouTube page. But as always, have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to this MVP podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Most Valuable Pod for more great podcasts.